Okay, guys, can we just show you something for one second? We, we talked about the criteria for ABN, the Hertel criteria. Why? Because there is some confusion about the Halker length and what it is. So, can you have a look, guys, for a second? So, as you can see, I mean, this is a periosteum, but the idea is when you have a calcar length here, is the vessel coming through here. So this is what you're thinking about. If the calcar length is 8 millimeters here, then you're confident this is not disrupted. Okay? And also, the amount of displacement medially. If you can imagine, if the vessels are here like this soft tissue, and the displacement is more than a centimeter, then this can be disrupted, and the blood supply can be affected. So this is what we mean. Calcar length is with the head, not with the chap. Okay? So you can see that on the CT. When you think about EBM. All right. Okay, so um, for the moment we're going to use uh, this system, um, which is very straightforward. It's like any other shoulder system, has a pin reamer, a series of brooches, and we're just going to show you this uh, very quickly. The, the pin reamer simply drops down inside the, the shoulder. If you, if you do have any substantial bone in the metaphysis, we just create ourselves a little slot uh, using the correct end of the osteotum, uh, Mr. Lambert, uh, just, just to start that off. And one of the wonderful things about this particular implant is that the brooch and the implants have this double curvature on the medial side of the stem and that fits the curvature of the calcar. So what happens is this drops into the shoulder and you've noticed on your preoperative x-ray where the fracture exits and of course you're doing this because the fracture exits high at the articular margin so the humeral head is um, avascular uh, so that drops in and simply sits up against the calcar and we could go a bit higher what's this a 12 okay so let's may we and what happens is, because this is shaped like the internal architecture of the calcar, the brooch simply finds its own place to sit. Now, do we have any other sizes of the brooch? Okay, that's not a problem. So what we would do is to increase the brooch from 6, 8, 10, 12 and 14 if necessary, and then put on... Okay, they're coming. And then we would, uh, thank you very much indeed, 10, okay. So here we go, 10, and that then sets nicely down and goes down inside. In an osteopenic or osteoporotic, 12 would be great, yes please. Um, we would expect that to accept quite a big, um, and there's the 12 going in and I'm just going to tap it because all it does is to find its own place and so I don't worry about um, 20 or 30 degrees this now is a stem that is meant for this person all right so what we've then got is this brooch telling us how high the articular edge will be this is the, the edge of the um, greater tuberosity so you can check this, whether this brooch is in too high or too low, by taking the greater tuberosity, here it is, putting it back where it was uh, broken from, and just seeing if the footprint is anywhere close to the shoulder of the implant. And you can see here that actually it matches really quite well. So this brooch looks like it's in about as far as it needs to be. Well, we can check that again by two things, by two ways. Um, have we got a little measure? Yes, we do, usually. A measure, like a, a ruler. On the scalpel handle. Yeah, thank you. Well done. If we have, um, we have a little ruler on the scalpel handle, from 
the footprint region, the highest part of the footprint region, to the apex of the fracture measures in here by eye, let's say 3.5 centimeters. And if we measure from the apex here to where 3.5 comes out, it's here. So once again, that's a secondary check. That looks about right, where those two lines bisect. And then the last thing is that um, we've got the pectoralis major tendon coming in roughly but wherever that is, it's disappeared to uh, somewhere in here. here we, there it is. So there's the, oh no, that's not the peck, it's under here. My poor old peck is here, there you go. The pectoralis major comes into this uh, lateral crista here and we're going to be seeing the pectoralis major very close to the upper border of the uh, cut surface here. So that's another way, but the, the, well, the way I tend to do it is to measure the, less, the greater tuberosity segment and then measure the height or, whoops, there we go, and then reduce the fracture temporarily here. Well done that cameraman, you're doing well. Okay, so now this comes out and the stem, which I put down somewhere, goes in. Where did I put the stem? Oh, here it is. Thank you very much. So, in this particular implant, we've got a, an applicator here. And this is always, for me, the most frustrating bit of this. There we go. And that then drops in here. And you just tap it home. And then, this it forms its own cutting guide because the humeral head has to sit flat on there. So now we want to just tr trim this flat, like that. Then we have, thank you very much indeed, two things. In this particular system, we have uh, obviously a head. And this thing here is called an eccentra. Do we have um, the small screwdrivers, please? Thank you very much indeed. So this is rather, this is the neat bit. This is the neat bit. So here is a, um, an eccentra. And you can see right at the top here, the letter A and a laser marker. That's the neutral position. And for fractures, that's what we choose. So we put this in here, like that. And we choose A as our position and then tighten that up. In a normal shoulder, there's a posterior medial offset. Whoops, excuse me. And what you can see is that this fracture prosthesis deliberately gives you a posterior offset. This isn't symmetrical on the stem. So that's designed, I'll just do it more accurately, to give you what nature's given you more or less an offset. Then we have a humeral head with a number of dial ins. And in a fracture situation, what we do is we say we choose the size of the head and we have left, zero, right. And this is a right shoulder. Here's a right shoulder. So we're going to be putting the right um, in line with this thing. So I'm going to. Here's the right and left. Here, we just turn that around until right goes to the top of the shoulder there. And just tighten that up. Now, that then creates 
an implant that has a nice calcar runoff. It has cover to the metaphysis at the back. It's slightly smaller than the native head, but what it does is to give you a, um, an implant trial against which you can now reduce the fracture. So now we bring the fracture in and then this bit has to sit underneath that humeral head. Okay, so, the, and then the lesser tuberosity will come in here into that hole there, like that, okay. So the bone sits underneath the rim of the humeral head. You'll notice that this particular implant has two holes in the, in the stem. Let's try and get that out again. There it is. So these two holes we use circlage wires through. And in the real situation, you might put a circlage wire through the lesser tuberosity, through that, through the greater tuberosity, and around the outside, and then again, through the lesser tuberosity, this hole, the greater tuberosity, and, search, and, and on the outside. So you've got two circlage wires holding it. And as Martin said yesterday in the talk, the circlage wire fixation technique in the laboratory is the much the best way of, of securing the lesser tuberosity and the greater tuberosity to the shaft rather better than all the figure of eights that uh, Pascal Boileau and the Lyonnais uh, team recommend. So um, this implant builds your fracture to it very successfully. I hope that that's demonstrated that the most important things that perhaps take away from this, not just the implant, but measuring the height of that fragment from the footprint of the greater tuberosity supraspinatus junction to the apex of the fragment tells you how high the shoulder of the implant has to be above the fracture line and that's probably the most accurate way of doing this. In terms of orientation in retrotorsion this, excuse me, this implant gives it to us because the shape of the calcar fits the shape of the calcar so I don't have to worry about whether it's 20, 25, 30 or whatever. But there is a tool designed to link to these things here to give you a retroversion, antiversion with respect to the forearm. Oh, yes. Uh, I, have a question. I have a question. If the calca fits, but the length of the greater tuberosity doesn't fit, yeah. How then uh, do a oh. strategy? So, not uncommonly, the calcar is broken inferior to the articular edge, so the stem has to be slightly higher. And I would then recommend using the height of the greater tuberosity as the guide and set the implant to the height of the greater tuberosity. I wouldn't set the, tuberosity, the implant lower and then crowd the tuberosities. That doesn't work as a leverage. Okay, thank you very much indeed.